This evening's discussion is a Buddhist sol solstice celebration. And the winter solstice in the area where the Betzman is located occurred yesterday at approximately 11 a.m. However, today is a mere, the day is a mere two seconds longer than it was yesterday. So I'm not sure that you'd really notice the difference. And you can use your um, handout. I'm not going to present a slideshow of this. Just use your handout and follow along with me. And of course, we, I want to start off with, well, what is the solstice? And the solstice, as you can see on the handout, literally means that the sun is standing still. And people probably are aware of that. Um, literally means the sun is standing still. And, but we know that the fact the sun doesn't stand still. If it did, we'd all be in very big trouble. Um, but it's worthwhile to take a moment regarding this to just recognize that in our busy days, many of us tend not to be aware of what is the phase of the moon, what is the period in the season that we're in, just things that are part of the natural world. And so I like to use this opportunity of the winter solstice to uh, take a note of what's around us and stop in our, our busy lives just to notice what's going on. And I think that that can be really important. And here at the temple, we begin to observe the holidays starting with Shakyamuni, Shakyamuni Buddha's birthday on December 8th. Um, and then we basically are observing the holidays throughout December because you not only have Shakyamuni Buddha's birthday, and this year the um, uh, Hanukkah celebration occurred at about the same time as, uh, I don't mean his birthday, his awakening, day of awakening, Shakyamuni Buddha's day of awakening. But this year Hanukkah occurred about the same time. And of course we have the winter solstice, we have Christmas, and in Japan, actually, the, the biggest holiday of the year is uh, January 1st, and it's using the Roman calendar. In Japan, they don't use the uh, lunar calendar. They're using a, the Roman calendar. And during this, by the way, during this time of the year in Japan, everybody would be attending Boninkai, which means forget the year just passed, forget this last year parties. Um, and I think many of us would like to forget this last year, <laughs> in fact. And so there it is. Um, so as a result of our celebrating throughout December, we have in the gathering room, I don't know if you can see, maybe you can see the lights of a small, very, this year we did a very small solstice tree. Um, and, and we decorate it with symbols from all the major religions, especially Buddhists, there's a little uh, Lotus Sutra on there, as well as Horin and other, and other Buddhist symbols, but there's also the crescent moon and star, and there's crosses, there's even the Santa Claus. Most important, there's a Yoda, just to keep that in mind. Um, so it's a Hanukkah bush, it's a solstice tree, it's a Christmas tree, it's a New Year shrub. You can, you can apply to whatever term you like. But the idea is that you're bringing lights into the house, into our lives during this period of time, which can be a time of, of darkness. And in, in Japan, the winter solstice is, means the turning point from yin to yang, uh, ichiyu daifuko. And we, we, you don't, I, I know we're, we're talking about the uh, Buddhist winter solstice celebration. Well. Taoism is really embedded within Buddhism also, and Buddhism is embedded in Taoism in many ways. And you see that especially in, in East Asia. And the meaning turning from yin to yang, yin and yang, as everyone is probably aware, are ref referring to the dualities of dark and light, male and female, positivity and negativity, that sort of thing. Um, and the winter solstice is considered the most yin day of the year. And I've had a lot of women say to me, that's not fair. We get to, we, the most feminine day of the year is on the solstice. Well, I didn't invent it. I didn't make it up. That comes from Taoism. So don't blame me. I'm just the messenger. 
Um, and what's interesting about this is that while the solstice, the winter solstice is the most yin day of the year, the most meaning the most feminine day of the year, then that means that the summer solstice is the most yang period of time. So when we think about it, it means that as we move throughout the calendar year, we're moving between the feminine and the masculine, the masculine and the feminine. It's a continual, it's a continual movement from one into the other. So guys, today is the, the period to get your feminine stuff up. Just, just keep that in mind, okay? Um, there was a philosophy that's embedded in the natural cycles that we see in Shinto philosophy. And as you're aware, we observe all many of these Shinto uh, events in, in Buddhism also. Many people are, are probably not aware that previous to the Meiji Restoration, all the Shinto shrines in Japan had to be associated with either a Tendai temple or a Shingon temple. And so that that's just one aspect of how closely related, uh, especially Tendai and Shingon Buddhism are related to, to, to Shinto. Um, so one of the figures that we see during this time of the year is Amida or Amitabha Buddha. And Amitabha is the Buddha of immeasurable light. And it's a member of the Buddha family that oversees the winter solstice. It makes perfect sense because if you think about Amida Buddha being the Buddha of immeasurable light, now is the time that you want to bring light into the darkness. Um, and so he shines his light onto us as optimism, brightness, and clarity. And I'm, I'm just reading from the sheet that I, I gave to you. Amida Niyodai presides over the great Western paradise. And when a devotee dies, it's believed that Amida Trant descends from his paradise to lead the faithful back to the pure land. And Amida is the central deity in, in the pure land. And of course, um, pure land Buddhism, which in Japan, the the True pure land, which is Shin um, Jodoshu, is the most popular Buddhist um, Buddhist sect in Japan today. It has the most the most members. That is, um, so the immeasurable light that emanates from Amida Buddha is a symbol of hope and promise. And as the darkest nights of the year around the winter solstice are viewed as obscurity. We can see the light returning to our lives each, each subsequent day. Amida truly represents this sense of hope, reconciliation, repentance, and redemption. And all qualities are worth observing at this time of the year. And we will be in the near future have a discussion specifically on Amida or Amitabha Buddha and the Pure Land. We, we do this periodically, and I'll be doing that probably sometime in the next uh, few months. The other um, symbol that is associated with the winter solstice is Amaterasu. And Amaterasu is a Shinto kami or Shinto deity. Kami literally means uh, deity or spirit, and who is celebrated at this time of the year in Japan. And that esoteric Buddhism, including Tendai, Amaterasu is the counterpart of Dainichi Nyorai or Mahavirachana Buddha. And so there's a, a relationship between Amaterasu and uh, Mahavarachana or Dainichi Nyorai. Um, Amaterasu Omikami is the great divinity illuminating heaven. That's literally what the name means. And it's she is considered the Japanese sun goddess and one of the most important deities in the Japanese mythology. And She's considered to be a direct ancestor of the imperial dynasty. As a matter of fact, when the new emperor uh, is, undergoes a coronation, he has to go to Issei uh, and he spends the evening in the sacred shrine in Issei with Amaterasu. I don't want to get into what they do there. It's not my business. You know, this is that's private stuff. So I'm not going to go there. Um, the, but the connection between the winter solstice and Amaterasu is based upon the following legend. And, and I'll, just, I'll just read this for you because I'll leave all the, well, no, I'm actually going to put some good stuff in. Um, Amaterasu 
hid herself in a cave after being deeply insulted. And by the way, the reason she was deeply insulted is because her brother and sister were throwing um, excrement at her. Well, I would be pretty insulted myself, you know, to be honest with you. Anyway, so she went hiding in the cave. Well, when she went hiding in the cave, she took all the light with her because she is the, the deity from which light emanates. Where is it going to go? She's the sun goddess, you know, and that's spelled S-U-N, not S-O-N. And the other kami um, begged her to, to come out, to bring the sun back. But it was only after the kami of mirth hung a mirror on a tree and performed an erotic dance outside the cave. And by the way, this erotic dance, um, when Amaterasu was still not coming out, she had just stripped off. So she was dancing naked. I mean, the nice thing about, about Japanese uh, myths is that they are not subtle. <laughs> they're, they're, they're very fulsome in their, in their uh, symbolism. And so <clears throat> there was a mirror that was hung outside there. And Amaterasu was known to be fairly narcissistic. And so I, I don't know how Kami become narcissistic. I always think of that as a, a human characteristic, but this is the story. And so she reaches out of the cave and to grab the mirror. And as when she does that, then the other Kami near her grab her arm and they pull her out, thus bringing light out of the darkness. And by the way, Another connection with the imperial family is that there are three uh, objects that are considered sacred to the imperial family, and the mirror is one of them. It's a mirror and a sword and a particular necklace. And so the mirror is the mirror that is associated with Amaterasu. And if you go to a Shinto shrine in Japan, you will find uh, that's one of the main symbols in the, in the center of the Shinto shrine is, is the mirror. Um, so. Amaterasu comes out of the cave. She is convinced to return to the sky, which she does, and returns light in order to and brings order to the world. And so her return to the sky is celebrated on the day of the winter solstice, the 21st of December, uh, most notably. And it, it's Shishima Sensei. Did you did you have anything you wanted to say about? Um, Amaterasu or uh, Amida? Mm. <clears throat> well, Japanese Shintoism, yeah, Amaterasu, Omikami, uh, very famous, and uh, every house uh, has such a, what's a scroll of Amaterasu, Omikami, to, together with uh, Butsudan. <clears throat> and the Butsudan is an uh, altar, uh, there is uh, Amitabha Buddha. As you mentioned in Amitabha Buddha is uh, infinite light and the infinite uh, life. See, uh, well, a uh, uh, long time ago, um, about a decade ago, I uh, visited uh, a museum in India. <clears throat> there I saw very fast uh, statues. Oh, just, what, what should I say? Only legs remains. The oldest uh, <coughs> uh, statue of the Amitabha Buddha, about 150 AD. It was amazing that it says infinite light Buddha. So uh, the uh, Buddha statues appears around that uh, time, uh, King Kanishka, uh, who, uh, <coughs> what shall I say, devoted Buddhism uh, after Zoroastic uh, religion he believed in. And in uh, Amaterasu, uh, the case, you know, uh, according to the tradition, uh, she, is, she came to Japan uh, from the uh, South World, uh, standing on the Tatro, you know, Totas. Uh, and so it's uh, very interesting that uh, trends. Uh, came to Japan. The other side is uh, uh, island of Hawaii, that Polynesian style. So in Hawaii also, there is uh, such a uh, Hinokami, 
the god of uh, fire there, uh, especially in the volcanoes, famous place in the Big Island, uh, very famous for volcano. That is uh, uh, symbolizing also kind of amaterasu in uh, <laughs> Hawaiian way. Mm, and so uh, Japanese, uh, uh, e e almost uh, traditional, every house is this, they have amaterasu and amitaba. So that is a uh, custom in Japan, I think. I... Thank you, Sensei. Yeah. Thank you. So the solstice is by custom the darkest day of the year and filling the environment with light is a means to ward off the darkness and bring hope for spring, the promise of days filled with radiance and a metaphor for a better life. And so I think that, that you know, it, it's, it's rather interesting that when we are with our friends and our families at this time of the year, our friends and families may be many of them, uh, if we didn't grow up as Buddhists, they're Jewish, they're Christian, they could be Muslim. And the, there are many festivals that are celebrated based upon where you're, where you're from, what country you're from, what region you're from. There are many different uh, customs that are celebrated. And I think that we, that at least in North America, um, Schumann and myself have decided that part of what we're going to do is we're going to make this period of time also a Buddhist holiday. We're not going to co-opt another holiday. We're going to make it our holiday. So how would we celebrate or observe a winter solstice from a Buddhist perspective? And I've listed several things here, a celebration of the Buddhist festival of lights, um, which is looking at Amitarasu, Amitarasu and as well as, as Amida. Be aware of the continual change of the seasons. I think that it's really important to recognize that we've gone from one season to another season. Observe the fellowship with each other. And this is especially important during this period of time that we've been in a period of darkness now for several years, in fact, because we have not been able to share um, our fellowship personally. Uh, we've been doing it primarily through Zoom. Recognize, recognize the change of yin and yang as a transition from masculine to feminine period of time of the year and recognize that these are masculine and feminine qualities. And in this context, I have to say that one of the things we don't talk about very much is that as Tendai, as an esoteric tradition, um, the masculine and the feminine become very important symbols. Uh, because when you look at the front of our, of our temple, you'll see the Taizukai on the right and the, and the Kongukai on the left as you're facing them. And the Taizukai represents the feminine and the Kongukai represents the masculine. The Taizukai represents compassion and the Kongukai represents wisdom. Um, and so within esoteric Buddhism, I, I could go into that in much more detail, but I'll stick to what we're talking about tonight. Um, it's important to recognize that in esoteric Buddhism, the masculine and the feminine are, are, an import, are important characteristics. And also we want to witness the period of the next three months as an opportunity to observe our practice in the daily acts of our lives. So for the next three months during this winter time, winter becomes, especially if you're in the Northern hemisphere and you're in the North, northern aspect of the northern hemisphere. It's a period of time in which we tend to um, be more introspective because it's, it's darker, it's cold, we're staying, hanging around our houses uh, and that sort of thing. So this is a good opportunity to use this period of, of more contemplative period to an advantage. And that advantage is to practice looking at our lives uh, meanfully and, and uh, in a way that contributes to our overall Buddhist practice. And I, I have a, a poem that I found that I really thought was really nice by Patty Wigington. 
and I'll just read it. The longest night has come once more. The sun has set and darkness fallen. The trees are bare, the earth is asleep, and the skies are cold and black. Yet tonight we rejoice in this longest night. Embracing the darkness that enfolds us, we welcome the night and all that it holds as the light of the stars shine down. I just thought that was a really nice uh, poem for the, for the winter solstice. So regardless of how we might observe this transition, allow the joys of the seasons to embrace you. And I'm going to go to the next slide. And I will be unmuting everyone for your questions, comments, or thoughts. But I got to unmute you first. So hold on just a moment there. Here we go. OK. Anybody got have a question or a thought or a comment? Say Chi. Uh, and, and then John, by the way, so you know. Go ahead. For, for the event of the emperor meeting with Amaratsu, would there not have been a set of instructions or a formalized ritual which would be expected to be carried out at at such a, a you know at that particular uh, a, a event in 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 um, in the Shinto uh, traditions? Well, there is, but they're not telling us what it is. Oh, there <laughs> will be. <Okay. laughs> and no one and no one is permitted inside of the shrine except the Shinto priests and the uh, emperor in that particular shrine. At the shrine at Issei, yeah. Thank so I'm, I'm not implying that there is that we don't that that someone doesn't know what's going on, but no one's telling us what's going on. It's, yeah, well, it's, 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 it's supposedly communing with Amaterasu, whatever that means. Well, I would have been surprised if it were strictly free form. Right. <laughs> Just, <laughs> we, well, talking, we are talking about Japan. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, John, you had a question. Well, what do Buddhists do in the Southern Hemisphere? That's a really good question. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> <That's very good. laughs> I stumped the sensei. <laughs> the sensei. <laughs> Although, remember, the summer, the summer in the Southern Hemisphere, the summer solstice would be their winter solstice and vice versa. So right. they would be, uh, presumably, they would be doing whatever we do now, six months from now. <laughs> That's what I was getting at, really. Yeah. yeah. Well, they just reverse it. But, but, I, but in fact, I don't know what the Buddhists, let's say in Bali, as an example, uh, since there are many Buddhists that were in Bali, um, they may very well have, have some celebrations there for winter and summer. Um, I, I don't know. Do you, do you know, Glenn? I mean, no, I'm, I'm just, I was just saying because like Bali, because Bali is also in the Southern Hemisphere. Also, yeah. when you look at the uh, the Earth, the uh, the globe, it is like right, literally, it's south of the equator. So I was just saying, but you know, I mean, I mean, you know, in that part of the the globe, it's basically warm all year round. I mean, the only the only I mean, like we, the only like seasons we have are like what you call wet and dry season. Right. Like, that's pretty much it like it's you know we we pretty much have like just pretty much roughly have the uh same almost the same amount of daylight every you know throughout the whole year so right you know, but at least and also for those who are for those buddhists in the southern hemisphere during this time of the year at least they don't have to deal with uh with long darkness so oh. yeah <laughs> yeah Thank you. And thank, thank you, John. That was, that was a good question. Glenn, you had your hand up before I asked you the question. Did you have a question or comment? Uh, yes, uh, not, not a question, but a comment um, uh, about the winter solstice, like in, especially in, you know, in, 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 in Asia. Uh, we, do have, we do have like the winter solstice celebration in Chinese tradition. Uh, we go Dongzi, or it's not as Toji in, uh, in Japan. Jap I, in Japanese, I think. We, uh, I think that you guys also celebrate it too, because you have you, you, you got toji. But um, yeah, we do have a we do have like a winter solstice in celebration in, in Chinese tradition. 
um and uh, uh, also um i know like with in, with the with the persians they have uh they call they they, they also celebrate the winter solstice where they call it, uh shabiyada and um in 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 their in their tradition they they basically they uh they basically, uh, basically, they they get, like I don't want to say offer, but like they they display like things that remind like they this they display stuff that you know remind of the uh, basically of the warmer seasons like the summer and one one big thing obviously one big symbol obviously is the uh, the pomegranates, mm. and uh, yeah uh, you know I, I it's it, it's a long it's another you know it's just it's just another topic you know but it's just it's like a lot to mention there but I'm just saying. You know, it, it's all over. Uh, you know, the whole the whole uh, winter solstice celebration or commemoration, however you want to right. say it. Yeah. Thank you, Glenn. Are there any other? And and welcome to Hato. Uh, just joined us. Are there any other questions, comments, thoughts? Uh, Joe, please go ahead. Yes, this is my. This is a question to Chishima Sensei. Um, I know that there's a. Is a practice in Mikyo esoteric Buddhism called Hoshikuyo or Hoshimatsuri, paying homage to a star or stars. And you usually perform that around this time. Can you talk about it? Sensei, you're on mute. Ah, well, uh, in Japan, uh, Hoshikuyo, the uh, worship stars, uh, represent as uh, Myoken Bosatsu, uh, and the, uh, uh, that is, uh, you know, usually uh, priest going around the um, people, uh, the houses, uh, with uh, kind of the Myoken bo Bodhisattva. Myoken is uh, <coughs> marvelous looking, maybe kind of symbolizing stars. And uh, that kind of tradition is also, we have it in our area. Uh, we don't have that kind of Myoken Bosatsu at our temple, but near our temple, there are several uh, temples. They uh, have the statues of Myoken. There I saw the stars and uh, uh, Myoken symbolizing is, I think, a brilliant star. Uh, Hokuto Shichisei in Japanese, so seven stars in the sky, they worship that uh, uh, to bless us. I think that is uh, the tradition in our area. Thank you. And, and just to, to be a little bit clear, um, as Ishishima Sensei was, was noting that, you know, we think about uh, Tendai Shu, or we think about Nichiren, or we think about um, Jodo Shu, whatever sect of Buddhism we're talking about. And we tend to think about each of these schools as being almost monolithic within themselves, when in fact they're not. So that where Ichishima Sensei is living, um, there are many small villages around there. And each of the villages and each of the temples has its own way of doing things and its own practices and its own traditions that are very, uh, in many cases, idiosyncratic with uh, the other schools, with the other, even within the same school of Buddhism, but, but with, the, with the other temples. And so there is very much, um, not only in Buddhism, but in, in uh, East Asian religion in general, if you're talking about Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, Shintoism, et cetera, uh, you'll find local practices often are, um, the practices that are observed by the people there, they would consider the practices in the next village incorrect because their way of doing it is usually the right way to do it. But it, it really bring, brings a sense of depth um, to the practice of Buddhism. And, and here at the Betsuan, we do some things that are a little bit idiosyncratic and we do it our way uh, also because we're, of course, located in North America. We're not located in Japan. So we have adapted to our environment. So, And I think that when you look at a festival like the winter solstice or an observance like the winter solstice, you'll find many places 
uh, doing things in a particular fashion that are not shared by all the temples or all the shrines or all the other religious organizations. Just that, that's just a general comment. Um, time for one more question or comment. Yes, Jake. Yeah, so if I understood what you were saying towards the end of your presentation there, if I come to New York next winter, we're going to be having a winter solstice celebration then, right? That's correct. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm going, thank you very much. And, you know, this, this didn't have any very deep philosophical teachings or anything like that. But I, I think that we have to recognize that this time of the year is a time of the year, as I said before, in which, you know, for, for um, those of us who are Jewish, it's, it's a period of Hanukkah. For the Christians, it's Christian uh, Christmas. Um, there's a sense of, of goodwill and there's a sense of festivity that is around this time of the year. And I think that we would be, that we being all of us who are present here uh, this evening, we would be negligent if we didn't contribute to the good feelings that are felt by everyone. Uh, I think that that's really an important, an important aspect of this. This is a time to share, not a time to say, well, I'll do it my way, but it's a time to share with others. And so I hope that you do that. And I'm going to move us along a little bit. And it's, it really is nice to see everyone here this evening, by the way. It's, it's really a pleasure. And I'm sorry that some of us can't be in more in person, but it's great that we have the Maha Sangha uh, in this fashion. So I'm going to mute everyone once again. The winter solstice seems like an apt metaphor for the darkness that has descended upon us for the last few years. This has been so in a number of different areas. There's been a discord in the political arena, not only in the United States, but around the world, which has consequences that will be with us for at least the next several generations, probably beyond. There's been a grand reckoning that's developed centering on racial inequity, gender rights, police militarization, environmental crises, and income inequality. The outcome of these individual areas of environmental and social turmoil are existential in scope. And of course, we've experienced a worldwide pandemic that has altered everyone's life immeasurably. It has paused and reset how we live our lives in some ways, this has been beneficial, but in many ways, it's been disastrous, a seismic shift from where we were a few short years ago. One would have hoped that such an immediate worldwide catastrophe would have brought us together in order to meet the challenges of very real threats, but that has not been the case. Then starting a few years ago, we were plunged into the darkness of nights. We see a light on the horizon. It's a glimmer. Sometimes it seems to diminish almost entirely to flare up again and offer hope. In all of this, if all of this was not sufficiently dispiriting, there's the extreme polarization in our societies, which is reminiscent of the American war between the states. How will this resolve? Will this resolve? I'd like to make a connection here to Shramana Chigi in sixth century China. According to Chigi and the fourfold teachings, there are five periods of Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings, and I won't go into all of these or even outline them. I just want to mention the first two. I think that this is relevant. The first period is referred to as the Avatam Saka period. For 20 day, 21 days after, after Shakyamuni Buddha's awakening, he delivered 
the Avatamsaka Sutra, one of the most profound sutras. But no one understood it. People were baffled. And that's why this period lasted by tradition for only 21 days. Thus, he went on to the next period, referred to as the Agama, which lasted for 12 years. To explain the nature of reality in a way that people could understand, given their capacity, their prevailing worldviews, and limited insight. This was the teaching of Deer Park. This is the parallel I will draw to the cataclysmic events that I've enumerated above. What is it that people listened, listening to Buddha's discourse 2,500 years ago found unimaginable? And why is this relevant to today? The Avatam Sakha Sutra teaches interpenetration, the interpenetration of the one and the particularized many, of the spirit and matter. As Paul de Mieville notes, by notions of a gradual progress towards liberation through successive stages and an obsessive preference for images of light and radiance. Snuck that reference to the winter solstice in, didn't I? It is interpenetration that I wish to point out. Would people be as polarized today if they were not as dedicated to their own individualization of the provisional self? If they understood interpenetration? Keep in mind that the idea of interpenetration is not unique to Buddhism. It's found in many religious philosophies, as well as theoretical physics. The phrase interpenetration differently, any phenomena exists only as part of the next total nexus of reality. Its existence depends on the total network of all other things, which are equally connected to each other and contained in each other. There is no independent or autonomous sentient beings. We are all dependent on each other. People and cats, cattle and grass, grass and fungi, on and on. We're all connected in an inextricable web of existence. This is the parable of Indra's net. Each element of the universe is contained in all other elements of the universe, a hologram for the physics inclined. I agree, this is pretty heady stuff, and we may be as resistant to accepting it today as people listening to Shakyamuni Buddha 2,500 years ago, but that does not negate its reality. Could humankind be as callous toward the environment? Permit racist acts and policy. Be against vaccines. Be against vaccines which protect others, etc. If we embraced and embodied the essential teachings, which give preference for the images of light and radiance, I don't think so. As we've descended into the depth of darkness, we will now begin to emerge into the light. Each day, there is greater clarity and we must be open to receive that radiance. This is perhaps the greatest Buddhist teaching during the winter solstice, Svaha. And I'm going to move us along and unmute everyone. But first, a quote. Today, we celebrate light and honor the wisdom of shadows in connecting with the natural world in a way that honors the sacred imminence in all things. We establish a resonance with the seasons. And now, I'll move us along. <laughs> 